Well, good to be back in Ballyshillen. I didn't expect to be here, but uh, it is good to be here. I was meant to be somewhere else, so I've postponed them, uh, and, uh, and I'll fill that engagement next week, God willing. Whenever you're asked to do something at short notice, there's a panic comes on you. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to share with you what I've been doing in my quiet time, and I hope it's a blessing to you. Since the start of the year, I've been going through First Timothy. So I'm in First Timothy chapter 1. And uh, I don't know how you do your quiet time. Everybody does it differently. But as I go through the initial reading of the passage, usually take a chapter at a time, and I divide it up into what seems to me like sections or thoughts, and I write down on a piece of paper a word beside maybe one or two verses, and that's where I go through the, the chapter. So First Timothy chapter 1, the first word that I put down on my piece of paper was salutation or greeting, and you find that in verse 1 and 2. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the commandment of God our Savior and Lord Jesus Christ, which is our hope. Unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. It took me a week to get through that, those two verses. What a wealth as Paul writes to this young, budding preacher, Timothy, his protege, if you will, he was coming up and Paul could see the potential. And so he writes to him to help him. He says, my own son in the faith, whether Paul led him to the Lord or not, we're not just sure, but Paul's seen him as, as a, a, ch a spiritual child. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father. There's a sermon in each of those titles, of course. The second type thing that I wrote down in my bit of paper, verse 1 and 2 was salutation. Verse 3 to 22, the word I put down was standard. Stand, the standard of God. Listen to it. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than God the edifying which is in faith, so do. Now the end of the commandment is charity, or love out of a pure heart and of a good conscience and of faith unfeigned. From which some having swerved have turned aside unto vain jangling desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say nor where off they affirm. But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and the disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for men slayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. So in that section, Paul is uh, giving a broadside to all those who are trying to preach and are using the law in a way that is not suitable. So you have the salutation, one and two. You have the standard, verses three to 11. And then you have the spirit or the attitude. We see Paul's passion for his salvation, verses 12 to 16. It says, And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry who was before a blasphemer and a prosecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly and unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus come into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life 
everlasting. Ending of verse 16. So we have the salutation, one and two. We have the standard that Paul demanded Paul, that Timothy would preach, 3 to 11. And then this great doxology, this great uh, personal testimony of Paul's. And he says in verse 13 and verse 16, but I obtained mercy. And that's what all of us are standing in, isn't it? If we got what we deserve, we'd be in hell already. But we obtained mercy. Mercy. God gave us what we never deserved and held back what we really did deserve. This week, I've got to verse 17, and this is our focus tonight. And the word that I wrote beside this was not salutation or standard or spirit, but the song. This is a, an ancient doxology. It's an ancient hymn of praise, and it goes like this. Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And all this week, I haven't got past this verse. So I want to share with you a wee bit of what I've been enjoying in this old ancient hymn. And I've been reminded about the importance of perspective, getting our perspective right. You see, we see things through the prism of our circumstances. We appreciate salvation through the spectrum, the prism of our circumstance. We understand scripture from our perspective. So perspective is very important. In fact, on Tuesday past, Yes, Tuesday, I rang a friend that I used to work with in the bank. His name's Noel, and uh, Noel wasn't in. So I got his answer phone, and, and this is what his answer phone said. And I had to ring a few times to get it all down, but here's the way it went. He said, this is Noel. If you are the phone company, I've already sent the money. If you are my parents, please send me money. If you are my bank, you didn't lend me enough money. If you are my friend, you owe me money. And if you're a female, don't worry, I've got lots of money. <laughs> that was his, that was his <laughs> answer. For, and I thought, well, there's perspective. Depending on who it is that's ringing, he has a different response. Perspective. And, and perspective is particularly important as we come to God's word. And it's vital tonight as we consider this ancient hymn in 1 Timothy 1 and 20. And, and as I sat in my study, when I, I realized that when I got my perspective right, I, I very quickly discovered that the God that I serve is not 10% greater than me. And, and he's not 100% greater than me. And he's not a thousand percent greater than me. And he's not 10,000 percent greater than me. The one that I serve is so far above me, his ways are past finding out. That's what Paul said to the Romans, chapter 11, verse 33. His ways are past finding out. And so I spent time trying to get my perspective on this one that, that was the subject of this ancient hymn, now unto the God, eternal, immortal, invisible. And I thought about the, my, the right perspective of God. You see, I would never have flooded the world and killed the entire population except for eight people that God did in Noah's day, Genesis 6, 7, and 8. I, I wouldn't have done that, but God did it. I, I would not have sent serpents with poisonous venom into the camp of Israel at Edom, now in present-day Jordan, just over to the eastern side of Israel, when they were camped. And he sent the serpents in to kill people at random. I wouldn't have done it, Numbers 21, but God did. I would not have ordered the death of all the Amalekites. You remember Amalek was the grandson of, of Esau. Do you remember Esau sold his birthright to his younger brother Jacob? And there was rivalry ever since. And God says, I want you to kill the Amalekites. Men, women, children, infants, ox, sheep, camel, donkeys. Kill them all. I, I wouldn't have done that. 1 Samuel 15, but God did. 
And it's also true that I never would have given my son to the death of the cross to save those who hate him and despise him. But God did. And so I find that I can't put God into a wee box, neatly packaged, that my God works in a plane, works in a dimension far removed from anything that I'm used to. He works through a different mindset. And yet, that's it. The most important thing in life, the highest point of human experience, is to know God. Even though he's so far above me, even though I can't put him into a box and be able to understand him, I only can scratch the surface. Yet he invites me to know him. And Paul knew that. Paul, when he was writing to the Philippians in chapter 3, he said, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ. When it comes to 1 Timothy 1.17, I confess I'm out of my depth. And as I sat in my study and as I thought of these words, a summary of the character of God, uh, and up front I can tell you that anything I say tonight will woefully fall short of what it should be. I know that Isaiah writing in Isaiah 46 and 9, God says, I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me. None like me. Let's look at it. What does this hymn say? Now unto the King eternal. And I wrote down in my bit of paper the majesty of his character. He is the King eternal. He's the sovereign controller. He's the dispenser of all things. He's the ultimate authority. His counsel is not open to question. His ways are not open to debate. He's not some sort of spiritual fortune teller or predictor. No, God plans what is coming and then performs perfectly what he has planned. We have to sit and acknowledge that he is the king, the majesty of his character. And we have probably no problem in thinking of God being sovereign over creation, the, the natural world. We watch as he calms the storm in Matthew 8 and says, Peace, be still. And the wind stops. He's king over the natural world. We see him walking in the waves in Matthew 14. We see him sending Peter down to the the, the sea and say, get the first fish and open its mouth and you'll find a coin in its mouth, Matthew 17. And he's master of the natural realm. In Matthew 21, he curses the fig tree. He's, master, he's the king over the natural world. But also he's, he's not only master and king of the natural world, he's the master of the physiological world. And so we find that he's in control of the body and we see him healing the sick and healing the lame and healing the paralyzed and healing the mute and healing the dead. And he's, he's, he's the king over the physiological world. We have no problem with that. We pray for healing and pray that God will touch and meet the need. Not only is he king of the natural realm and the physiological realm, he's, he's also sovereign over the supernatural realm. And so he exercises demons and heals the demoniac in Matthew 8. And in those supernatural areas that we really don't know much about in our country, thankfully, but I've been in some parts of the world where satanic influence seems to hold sway. But the God that we serve, he is the the majesty of his character. He's king over the natural realm, the physiological realm, the, the supernatural realm. But, but where I struggle, is it's not the, the, the natural, and it's not the physiological, and it's not the supernatural. My problem is he's sovereign over me. That's where I have the problem. He, he's the king in charge of my life. 
We are not our own. Paul writing to the church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians 6, isn't it? Verses 19 and 20. For you're not your own. You've been bought with a price. And the Christian church and the Christian testimony has been damaged and made impotent because of a selfish, proud lukewarmness. And we fail to consider that he is sovereign over our life. A partially committed, half-hearted, convenient Christianity that has no bearing in Scripture, that's not found in this book. But that sort of lukewarmness has robbed the church of its dynamic power. And the gospel of the Bible is radical. The gospel of the Bible is extreme. The gospel of the Bible is fanatical. And it turned the world upside down. The majesty of his character. And I, if I get no further to me, that would be worth considering, wouldn't it? What difference does that perspective make? Well, I made a list. People who accept God's sovereignty over their lives and, and the fact that he's the king, they will give freely and openly, knowing that God is no man's debtor. When you know that God is the sovereign and the king of your life, you will love those who hate you and never love you back. Whenever you know that he is king, you're not obsessed with personal safety or personal comfort because you're trusting the king of it all. Whenever God is your king, you care more about God's kingdom than your pension. And you care more about the poor and underprivileged. And you want to obey God more than fitting into a Northern Ireland stereotype, the, the Christian status quo. When God is your sovereign, you long to be humble and teachable. You love the service of God. You're honest with God. You're nourished by God every day. You rest in God's purposes. You stand in awe of the King. David would know this. An old preacher from Jarrow in England, Harry Bell, used to stay in our house from time to time. And I know David has told the story before. I'm just underlining it so you know he wasn't telling you stories that weren't true. But I remember my mum taking her shoes off to go in to give him a cup of tea. Such was the man, such was the awe, such was the reverence for a preacher. But oh, now on to the king. And Jenny Hussey, writing about 1900, penned the words, King of my life, I crown thee now. Thine shall the glory be, lest I forget thy thorn-crowned brow. Lead me to Calvary. So if you get nothing more tonight, go home remembering that the one that we serve is the King of Kings. The majesty of his character. But then notice the infinity of his person. That was the next thing I put down. Because he's unto the King eternal. The infinity of his person. In other words, he's outside of the timeline of history. He, he is without a beginning. He'll never have an end. He's outside of this little timeline that we're used to and our mind is, is used to thinking. It's programmed that way. We think of a past, a present, a future. It's something had to have a beginning. It will have an end. It'll come to a conclusion. Not God. No, he's eternal. The infinity of his person. I was reading the other day of the Celestis group in Florida. They've sent up a rocket with the ashes and the DNA of 10,330 paying customers. The rocket will orbit about 1,900 miles up in space. They said she'd last about 63 million years. It costs about $14,000 per person. And they're trying to grasp at infinity. 
It's a nonsense, of course, to say nothing of a terrible waste of money, but it's certainly not eternal. Hey, it might last a long time and the ashes and the DNA will be out there somewhere, but it's not eternal. We look to the one who is eternal. In the words of Psalm 90, verse 2, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Past, present, future. Whenever John writes in John 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made, and so on. The infinity of God. The infinity of his person. Dear friend, we are a speck in time. And in the bigger scheme of things, you and I seem insignificant. But to God, he sees us chosen, called, redeemed, adopted, seated in heavenly places, glorified, done deal, done deal. Not, not someday in the future. He sees it as a completed act because he's outside of time. He sees me in heaven, glorified, spotless, with a new body like unto a son. That's how he sees me. Because he's outside of time. He doesn't have a past, a present, or a future. A speck in time, a speck in occasion, not even a blink of the eye. And yet he knows me. And he knows you and he loves you. He knows all about it. The majesty of his character unto the king, the Im immortality of his, of his, sorry, the infinity of his person unto the king eternal, and then the immortality of his nature, now unto the king eternal, immortal, the immortality of his nature. The idea here is incorruptibility. He does not decay like mortals. He does not get free. He does not get weary. He doesn't get bored. He doesn't get fed up. He doesn't get distracted. He doesn't get corrupted. I'm at that age now where every week I seem to be at the doctors for something. That seems, I mean, he knows, the doctor knows me in first name terms now. If it's not my ear, it's something else. If it's not that, it's something else. The body's not working the way it used to. It's, it's, it's decay. It's getting old. Ah, but not our God. Now unto the King, the Majesty, eternal infinity, immortal immortality. He doesn't change. He's the changeless one. Immortal. The, the amazing thing is that one day our mortal will take on immortality. One day there will be a transformation, a metamorphosis, if you will, that our mortal will take on an invigoration, an immortality that will never fade. And, and Decay and weakness and frailty and corruption will never touch us again. Never. Immortality. We will have a body like unto his glorious body. The majesty of his character, he's the king. The infinity of his person, he's eternal. The immortality of his nature, he's immortal. The invisibility of his being, he's invisible. Did you hear? Now unto the king, eternal, immortal, invisible. He cannot be seen. Yet, yet, God throughout scripture longs to be seen and longs to be known. And he describes himself in anatomical ways and terms and languages that we're familiar with, even though he's invisible. Yet his eyes search and his mouth whispers. 
and his smile radiates and he inclines his ear to our cries and he talks about his hands and his arms and his fingers that build and shape and give and protect and deliver. His heart can be broken. His nostrils flare when he's angry. His face reveals his glory and his blessing. He's invisible. And yet he wants us to know him. And see him. And appreciate him. And here in Ballyselling tonight, he is here to connect, to challenge, to comfort, to call, to convert. To meet you at the point of need. The invisible God made visible by faith. By faith. And it brings those things which are invisible to the unsaved world out there. It doesn't make sense. But by faith we see it afar. We see him who first loved us. Invisible. The majesty of his character is the king. The infinity of his person he's eternal the immortality of his nature he's immortal the invisibility of his being he's invisible the excellency of his wisdom to the only wise god he's omniscient that's a fancy word that theologians use to mean he knows everything and from that knowledge flows an infinite wisdom. And I'm not able enough to explain that. The psalmist said in Psalm 136, you know that psalm that every verse ends, but his, and his mercy, for his mercy endureth forever. For his mercy endureth forever. For his, every verse finishes, with his mercy endures forever. But verse 5, I think it is, says, by wisdom he made the heavens. <laughs> For his mercy endureth forever. Proverbs 3. The Lord by wisdom hath founded the earth. I spent much time thinking about the wisdom of God. And how silly it is for me to hide things from him. Because he knows. How foolish it is to try and pretend that everything's okay when it's not okay. As he knows. Pretending to be spiritual to others when God sees the heart and sees the mind. He is wise. The excellency of his wisdom. As we sit in Ballysill and maybe someone listening online or through a CD, let me put it like this. That problem that you carry, that hurt that festers, that worry that persists, that son, that daughter, that grandchild that gives you sleepless nights, that loved one, that bill, that crisis, that lump, that pain, that prognosis, that mistake, that sin. It's all known to the wise God of heaven. He knows exactly where we are and what we're going through. And he says, Yea, when you go through the valley of the shadow, fear no evil, for I'm with you. What a difference that makes. When we come to him and we tell him all about it from our perspective, and he's the great burden bearer. What difference does it make? I have a song that comes on periodically in the car when I'm driving. I think it's the Ball Brothers that sing it. But one line in it is, Sometimes he calms the storm. Other times he calms the child. Yeah? I've proved that. Sometimes he calms the storm. And you think, what was I worried about? Another time the storm rages on and he calms my heart. He says, Lawrence, don't worry, I know all about it. And I'm in control. This is our God. What a song. Now unto the king, majesty of his character, eternal, the infinity of his person, 
immortality of his nature, and what invisible, the invisibility of his being, the only wise God, the excellency of his wisdom. <laughs> this is our God. And far more, we, we, this hymn doesn't deal with the fact that he's self-existent, he's omnipresent, he's omnipotent, he's holy, he's righteous, he's just, he's true, he's loving, he's faithful, he's light, he's merciful, he's gracious. The list is endless. And you know something? Throughout eternity, we'll still see the wee facets of his beauty. My wife's not here tonight. Imagine I took her to Mar... Don't be saying to her if you see her. Imagine I took her to Lund's Jewelers. I don't think I've ever been in it in my life. But my, when I go in, it'd be, oh, sir, please come in, have a seat. Madam, please sit down. Don't worry, a cup of tea, coffee. <laughs> you see, and they're trying to say us how big my bank balance is. But if, if my wife picks her ring, you know what they'll do? They'll put out a piece of black velvet. Why? Because the, the diamond will sparkle all the more against the black background. And they'll say, this one, this one is only half a million. Only. <laughs> you two of them. Sometimes our lives are like the black velvet. Dark, foreboding. We don't know what way to turn. It just makes the sparkle of the diamond of God sparkle all the brighter. Now on to the king, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, says Paul, to him be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen just means so let it be. What a song. Tomorrow morning, I'll be starting verse 18. But what a song. May that song ring in our heart. That the God that we love, the God who saved us, the God who sent his son to die for us, he's majestic in his character. Infinity of his person. Immortality of his nature. The invisibility of his being. The excellency of his wisdom. Unto him be honor. Honor in our life and glory forever, forever. Not when it just suits you, not just on a Sunday, not when it is convenient, but forever and forever. Amen. Let's pray together. Our Father, we. We know that we don't do a verse like that justice. Father, we thank you for the depth in this hymn from the ancient of days. Father, it does make some of our modern hymns seem very surface and very trivial. But Father, as we have tried to glean from it tonight, may these thoughts fill our hearts with joy. That, Father, the one that we serve is greater than all our problems, greater than all our needs. And he is worthy of our undying loyalty and our service and every bit of our worship. Take us home in safety for Christ's sake. Amen.